festival or like give me some key things so that I can go and go, grab, look, review, give me 10 seconds to review this, walk in. How do you remember that, right? So you become this yeah. team that becomes a superhero. They're servant leaders. They're behind the scenes and they allow the space for people to grow into. I think that's a really important comment. You got $50 for 60 people. Like that puts you in a whole different bracket of like compensation. Like you have to quantify these things and bring the value to your pages like you do your team. Take team. Look, you go on vacation. You have the ability to make a lot more than your base salary or hourly if you're an A player. The reemployment rate is like 95 or above. That's the one thing that relates to the most healthy, productive, profitable business out there. In the DSO, if it's above and the profits blow up, it allows the marketplace to help the world for your practice. So your valuation it's been, it's actually been really great. Yeah. It's really been great to get me past some of the plateaus and obstacles I've had in my practice growth and development. And I've been children. blown away by both of them. I've been, I've been studying from afar, I've been learning from them, and they both are incredibly uh, genuine people, it seems like, and they want to help. And so when, they, when I heard they were putting on an event at the last Voice of the Industry, they made a mention of it, I walked up to them and said, I'm going to be there. And a lot of people here are the same way. I think that's why this is such a cool summit. It's different than any other CE because it brings like-minded people together. And um, I hope they throw it again next year because I'll be here. <laughs>
Well, Wes, the top, even though this is your podcast today, I want to get into a title here that I'm sure yeah. you're going to, you're going to love. So we're going to talk about metrics today. So I want to know what the top three metrics are that practice owners need to know to move the needle. And it's probably not what they think. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let me and, ask you and just one little context this topic, by the way. Go ahead, Craig. One little context, just so that our listeners know. So, so I've been using dental Intel in full disclosure for about four years. <clears throat> Uh, Pete uh, joined up with Dental Intel, what, maybe two years ago, would you say? Uh, Half years ago, yeah. No. And um, we are both paying customers of Dental Intel, and uh, it's been Full wonderful. paying customers, as a matter it's, of fact. It's been wonderful for us. Wow. We've uh, been able to extract a, a massive amount of value. And invariably, through the different things that Pete and I do, people are always like, oh, well, we want you to talk about this instead or talk about this product. I'm like, well, what does it do? you know, uh, well, it doesn't do this and this. I'm like, well, we don't really care. We're not here to get a kickback from another product. We want to provide value to our, to our fellow colleagues. So the spirit of this podcast and the spirit of everything we do with Dental Intel is to help our fellow colleagues because without knowing what your numbers are telling you and to extract the data from your practice management system is so freaking hard. Before I met Wes, I actually had a guy on the line to build me a custom data extraction tool. I don't know if I ever told you, Wes, but it was like 15 or 20 Gs. He did it for big DSOs. This is, this is five years ago. Just because I couldn't, I had all these other products, you know, I don't want to mention names, but they just didn't work and they were giving me corrupt data and I couldn't get it. It was really confusing charts. So we, we want to just let the, our colleagues know that what Dental Intel does and the reason why we're both paying customers and not getting a, uh, um, our services for free, although we're, we're open to that, Wes, uh, is that it, it extracts the data in a very easy to read color metric showing you what to look at and also tells you what to look at too. So a lot of data extraction tools will show you data, but you don't know what you're looking at. So like one of the big things that we always talk about is pay, uh, doctors are always proud to tell you that they have, you know, 100 new patients or 50 new patients a month. And no one even knows. I was just talking with a huge DSO recently. And I'm like, what's your net patient growth? And these are guys that have 100 offices. And like, well, what do you mean net patient growth? I'm like, well, it's your number of new patients plus all the ones that are becoming inactive 18 your months attrition. in one day, your attrition. And that just like, it was like, they're, they look like deer in headlights. It was such <laughs> brand new news to them. And, yeah. and, and no fault of their own. It's just, I, I want to credit Wes and Dental Intel and the guys over there. And I have a lot of friends now that work with you because it's, it's like family to me. Um, they, they actually spend the time and they create the data and they show you what to look at, what to pay attention to. But like everything else, if you just get, if you just turn it on, it doesn't do crap for you. You actually have to move on the data. There's a re I want to put a pin in this, Wes, but we should talk about that Facebook post that was circulating. I commented on it. Someone was like, yeah, I used dental Intel and you know, it didn't do crap and it's a lot of money. And I'm like, you know, a scale doesn't do anything for you, but a scale <laughs> is a tool when you're trying to lose weight. If you're trying to lose weight, you can think you're losing weight and actually gain weight. So don't blame the scale. The scale is just a tool. Dental Intel is just a tool. It gives you easily digestible information that you must act upon. Right. And, and, and I'm sorry, now we can go into it. I just want to give the background because I know some people are going to listen to two minutes of this and say, oh no, my buddy, you know, Dr. Jones used Dental Intel. It's total BS. It didn't work, blah, blah, blah. I just want to just give the value of what it is and that we're paying customers and why we do what we do. So sorry, Wes. No, I, I love it. We're, we're really passionate. It sounds like you're passionate about information and data. And I love that about you, Craig. And also Peter, I know both of you guys are, are students of this and, and you care about what's going on performance wise. One of the things that I think I love most about being in your home, Craig, years ago is that you are passionate about using data, not just to improve the production and performance and profitability of your practice, but you've been able to draw the line on identifying on how that improves patient care. In fact, I think I got a text shortly after one of our training sessions in your office that said, hey, Wesson, pretty cool. After utilizing this and the training that we had last Friday, we saw an increase of treatment acceptance percentage by 10%. And, um, and my, my mind went 10% went math mathematically to, wow, that's $1.2 million more production in your practice in a year. But your mind immediately was, that's a lot more patients getting the care that they're needing to get. And uh, that's what data analytics can really help people do. Yes, we want to improve our performance. We want to improve our practice. But at the same time, we have a code that we have to follow on ensuring that our patients are getting the help that they need to get. 
and uh, data absolutely can help you do that. And I think that's what's unique both about you and Dr. Bolden is you see that and you're using that to drive patient care and driving patient care is going to drive performance. Well, um, Wes, Weston, in our last uh, summit, literally we talked about this a lot and it was a big component of the financial kind of, we call it pillars and we're kind of pivoting from that terminology of pillars, but Regardless, it, you know, we're big, Craig and I both ascribe to the fact of Pearson's law, which basically says, you know, what, what, you, what you measure just inherently increases and without having awareness and, and um, you know, to your point, Craig, like the scale, right? If you're actively getting on the scale every day and being like, oh, look, right, you're conscious about like trying to lose weight, like it just happens better than hoping and wishing and praying that, that like, oh, things are going to change. Right. So it's just Pearson's laws is you get what you focus on kind of thing. And if you're focused right. on the numbers and driving that, you know, we'll talk about the metrics here, but if you if you start focusing on these three key metrics to move the needle where the rubber meets the road, like you can't help but to win. And to follow that, Peter, you can't get where you want to be. You cannot get there if you don't know where you're starting out. Mm, and, GPS. and the best way to really put this into context is airlines have figured that out. They start off with book, show me where you're flying from before you tell me where you want to go to. I mean, that is the first thing. And, and we as practice owners, we have to know where we're at in order to get to where we want to go. And you're a hundred percent right, Peter, when you say, when you focus, when you measure those things, when performance is measured, you're going to improve there. And those who know where they're at in relationship to where they really want to be are going to have a much better chance in getting there. And look, we all know, that in dentistry, a lot of you will get there anyways, or you kind of settle. You literally will settle for, because it's great, you're making $400,000 a year and you're thinking, okay, this is really good. And you, and you settle for that. But the reality is, and it's not just about money, but there's so much more opportunity to really help you and your team grow faster and more and the patients receive the care. And so my, my whole purpose of dental intel and analytics and, and data visualization and data applications that tell your team members what they need to do to improve is about not ever settling. Don't just settle. Don't just accept where you're at. There are ways to improve. Even if you think where you're at is good, I'm telling you, there's better. And why, why not go and get the better? Why not continue? Well, going? Also in a practice like ours, um, we, we don't have a, a very cosmetic cosmetically driven practice. So we're not doing a lot of treatment plan and presentation of getting people, you know, switching their teeth out just for the pure aspect of a cosmetic improvement. We right. will make a cosmetic improvement if someone's unhealthy and they have to have their front tooth pulled and blah, 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 and restore a vertical. So I tell my doctors all the time when they're saying no to you or you're not doing a job of enrolling them, their disease is getting worse because nine, nine times out of 10 in my practice, it's just restorative dentistry that needs to be done. So if you fail to get them to do the dentistry, or I know it's taboo, but I would say it's to sell the dentistry, it's going to get worse for them. Um, and uh, you're not failing the profit of the practice, you're failing the patient itself. I mean, listen, the US government through initiative spends hundreds of millions of dollars on things like don't text and drive, don't drink and drive, um, use your seatbelt. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get us to live longer because we don't want to do stupid things. So it's the same thing. You need to spend time and energy educating patients or selling them, as taboo as that sounds, on what they really need. Mm. Because if they don't take care of the six and seven millimeter pocket, it's going to get worse. It's going to lead to heart disease. I mean, I had a patient that came in yesterday. I could smell the periodontal disease, disease in the room. And one of my doctors was like, you know, let's find out what your out-of-pocket costs are. And I'm like, hey, you know, guys, I'm going to jump in here. The guy had a heart valve replacement surgery six months or six, no, six years ago, and he's got periodontal disease again. I'm like, dude, this is not about money. This is about getting to live. You know, let's not talk about what your insurance is going to pay. I don't even want to have that conversation. I can smell the disease in your mouth, like being here. I, you know, there's massive amounts of bacteria that are circulating through your bloodstream. We're failing you if we have a money conversation here. You can figure out how to have a money conversation. I'm here to tell you what you need and you can figure out whether or not your life is worth the value or not. Craig, that is why your treatment acceptance percentage is significantly higher than the average practices out 100%. there. 100%. Yeah, but my doctors are not there. So it's like, you know, I've got some newer doctors that are new to the practice. So it's, I've got to focus on that with them. I'm like, whoever brings up money first, the money, I mean, I've had so many patients and I'm sure the colleagues that are listening to this podcast can agree. Patients will tell you right to your face, I can't afford to do that. And then invariably you'll see them, you know, or like, you're like, let's book your next hygiene visit. Like, oh yeah, but, but I'm going to be on a cruise for three weeks in Europe. 
you know, your the 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 crown that you wanted to do is you know twelve hundred or a thousand or whatever. The cruise they're spending is fifteen thousand. Yeah. So I tell people, you know, I'm fortunate to have a decent amount of money. I, I tell people I can't afford that. What I can't afford that means is it actually means I don't have value for what you're saying. And what I love about dental intel is it quantifies how much yes you're getting. Not yeah. only does it quantify the yes you're getting, but the teams, the effective pairs, like when you're working with Betty, that hygienist, or Diane, that hygienist, how much better things can be, which is really cool. I love that feature. I, I, that's an underutilized feature in my office because some of the hygienists I have the best rapport with, I feel like, oh, I must be closing great with Diane, but in fact, it's Betty that does better. Sorry, Pete, we'll get Pete's raising his hand. We'll get to you in 10 minutes. So anyway, so Betty, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead, Pete, I'm sorry. I want to circle back to something you said, Weston, about, uh, about settling, because it's one of my pet peeves, and I hear this a lot, and I can totally agree with you, right? But that's the biggest myth in dentistry, I think, is that like, oh, I'm good, I'm, I'm good, I'm going to coast, right? And I have heard that. I actually heard someone say it this week, and literally, there is no such thing. There's no equilibrium in coasting. You have to, you're, you're either growing or you're contracting, but you have to pick one, because the world right. is changing all around you. So. Right. If you think that you can coast and you can be good without adoption of, of sound business principles, especially in today's day and age, you are sadly mistaken. You cannot coast. And you may coast. You may coast. But by the time you recognize, oh, shit, I couldn't have coasted. Now you're five years behind the eight ball. Yeah. And, and regaining that, that, that throne that you were kind of that coasting throne is going to be almost impossible. So guys, the reality is when you recognize that you're behind it is typically it's when too late. It's to too late. That's what I'm saying. Retire and it's too late to fix anything. That's uh, yeah. passionate so, about helping these private practitioners really thrive and keep up and compete with these but, large groups and corporations. But the large groups, one thing they do so much better than the average guy is reporting on numbers. You yeah. ask a guy, you ask a guy that worked in corporate for a while, he knows every freaking statistic. He's like, oh, my production, I've, I've had guys like that. I had a guy that used to work for Nybauer Dental Care in the Mid-Atlantic. I was a, probably a regional DSO with probably, I don't even know, 50, 150 offices, something like that. The guy knew his case closing metrics. He knew all of his metrics. And Pearson's Law, to quote it exactly, because it's such a, ph- a phenomenal concept, is when performance is, is measured, performance improves. And then the second part is when performance is measured and reported back, the rate of improvement accelerates. So by Pearson's law, getting back to the scale analogy, if you own a scale and have it in your bathroom, but you're not even intending to try to lose weight, owning a scale and having it in your bathroom tends to have people lose weight because you weigh yourself. So just the sheer act of having a physical measurement makes people improve. Now think been- what would happen if you were required to go post that weight on social media every single <laughs> time, right? What's going to happen with that individual? They're going to be held accountable. Why don't you do that, Wes? Why don't you gamify dental intel? Why don't yeah. you make usernames? Like Pete could be Slick Pete and I could be Tall Skinny Craig. And That's whatever. a really good idea. That'd be and a lot of gamify. Fun. Let gamify it see where they're at that'd be a lot of fun because listen you got to make the numbers more digestible it's not game that of crowns fun. yeah game of crowns yeah. i, I want to and hey game i want to crowns say Boom. game of crowns you heard it here first no, oh, heard it. i've got a good way for you to go find your crowns i was just in an office just two days ago we sat down with them and i asked the doctor what's your favorite procedure and i figured it was going to be either implant bridge or crown one of those and uh, sure enough, he said crowns. And so then I looked at the office manager and said, so when you schedule the doctor's holes this next week, which he had seven of seven openings, um, I said, what, what, how do you go find, what do you want to schedule? And uh, she said, well, I go to the unscheduled list and I find those patients that I have notes on that I need to call. And I said, well, how many crowns do you have unscheduled that you guys presented last month? Guess what she said? No idea. Mm-hmm. I have no clue. And I said, okay, well, let's find them real quick. So we found them really quick, like within 30 seconds. And it was 68, 68 crowns that he presented in this same month that were unscheduled crowns. And so I said, can you call all these? She's like, no. And then I asked, well, what's, what's your least favorite insurance company? Like, let's get rid of those patients. The funny thing is when they said that it was a majority of them, but it still left 13 patients there. So I said, okay, you got, you got seven holes. Let's fill these seven holes with these 13 patients. I got a text back from her yesterday saying she filled six of them with those focused patients. Wow. And then the next week, just doing the crown, which is phenomenal, right? And so I, I do want to get back to Peter's question originally. 
of what are the three most important metrics to move the needle um, and, and comment at the end of it, it's not what you think because we're all given metrics. There's over 300 plus metrics that you can measure and monitor in a dental practice. And you guys, we've all gotten down in the weeds before. We've all done it. We go so deep thinking, I need to know the percentage of crowns that convert, or I need to know that and it's paralysis by analysis. We, we can't move because we're looking too, right. too deep, right? So deep. I do want to answer these questions, although that's a tough question, by the way. So before I answer it. What's a tough question? What the are top, the three? Top three. Top three. I mean, I, I already know in my mind what I want to say, but I, I want to ask a question real quick, and I'd love every all your listeners just to think about this. If I were to ask you, what are you measuring your practice now? Now, Peter and Craig, take off your dental intel hat, and I want you to think about what we have. If I were to ask Dennis right now, what do you guys measure in your practice today? New I, patients, I, I collections, write. and production. That's oh, it. Oh, I'm just going to write it down first and put it up before you said it. Say it right. again, Peter. New patients. All they measure is new patients, collections, and production. Okay. So that is super majority. I don't care how many times I've been out there lecturing, teaching, talking, educating, training, onboarding a customer. We ask that question first. What do you currently measure? And almost always, almost always, it is those three things. I only measure one of those. New patients? No. Production. Collections. Collections. Okay. Yeah. The revenue coming in. Well, everyone looks at it and it seems natural to look at that, but here's the problem. If you miss a mark, if you miss your production mark, or if you miss your new patient mark, or if you miss your collection mark for the month, the doctor says, and let's say you miss it by 20 grand, your collections. What's the doctor going to go do with his team? Yell at them. Well, yeah, hopefully, oh, Craig, you better not be yelling at your team, but yeah. No, I don't. My team's too large. What do most of them do? I mean, what, when we think about what doctors, how do they respond to that? Either they get super stressed and hold it in and it's bottled up. And then throw instruments. And they throw instruments. They get frustrated. There's a little bit of anger, right? Mm -hmm. But they may not expose that anger and it's more passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. Or they have a conversation with the team and it's a more composed doctor that she or he has a, has a good conversation with the team. But the reality is at the end of that conversation, it's guys, we need to do better. We need to do more. We need to work harder. And the assistants and the hygienists and the schedulers are sitting there thinking in their mind, I know guys, cause I've interviewed a lot of these assistants and hygienists and office managers of yours. They're thinking, what do you mean do better? Do you not know what I'm doing right now? Do you not know how much effort I'm putting in? They're doing literally the best they can with what they know with what they know. And, and I think that's the key takeaway. Sometimes we say we gotta do more production. Well, what am I gonna go do to do more production? Or sometimes we say, I've gotta get more new patients. Well, what am I really gonna do to go get new patients? And all we say is we need more, 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 more. So if we can really narrow this down to three metrics that you could focus on and you can measure in your practice right now to really kind of gauge where you're gonna be, I have my idea what those are and I wanna share them but I want, to, I want your guys' opinion. I want to know what you guys feel those are first. And um, so, and my guess is, because you guys are students of this, you're probably going to come up with the same ones I would come up with, or at least two out of the three. Okay. Let's Can I see. put it back on you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Craig, let's start with you. Like, what if you're a student of dental until you have been for four years? So, if I were to ask you right now, what if you could only pick three metrics, name one of those three. And, and I have a piece of paper here. So those of you that you are looking, that you're looking at this, I'm gonna write down in red pen right now, all right? So I'm gonna write it down. And honestly, I don't care what you say. Okay. I just want you to say what comes to mind and I'm gonna write okay. it down and I'm gonna show my screen. For me, the number one, I think, is the pre-appointment rate. Wow. Okay. I was not gonna say that. Because I remember we had a podcast with a guy who said that's most linked to successful practices. One metric. Yeah, awesome. And then what, what would you say? What would you say, Peter? I'm torn right now. Um, I would say average production per patient per visit. Okay, good. So I'm gonna show I'm gonna show my paper now. Can you guys see this? Not all listeners. Is it backwards? No, you're good. Okay, no, what's the perfect. first thing you so see we up do, there? So most people listen to this from an audio, so we'll, we will have to say, okay, so on your piece of paper right now, it says 
Wes wrote it out. It says PPV. Okay, what does PPV stand for? Production per patient visit, I'm okay, guessing. So that's the average production per patient visit. And then the next and item. it says hygiene percentage. Hygiene reappointment percentage. Okay. So hygiene, yeah, sorry. Hygiene reappointment correct. percentage, which by the way, is 100% the leading indicator to Craig's metric, which was what, Craig? The overall productivity in the office. Overall pre-appointment. Like your, yeah. your metric that you're saying was pre-appointment. I'm going to talk about this hygiene reappointment. And the last one is? Treatment acceptance rate? Yes, treatment acceptance percentage. Yeah. So if I could only measure in my practice right now, three metrics, that's it. That's all I was going to look at. Three things that I could measure. It would absolutely be my average production per visit. And I want to talk a little bit about that metric and what that means. My hygiene reappointment metric, my hygiene reappointment percentage, which is the leading indicator to what Craig was talking about. And he said pre-appointment percentage. And then the last one would be treatment acceptance percentage, meaning out of all the dollars I'm asking patients to, to do, to, to spend, to get healthy, what percentage of those patients are actually saying yes to that? Um, so production per visit. You guys know how to measure this. How do you measure it? Don't say dental intel. How do you measure production per visit? Let's say that you wanted to look at your average production per visit for the month of, what month are we in? April. May, oh, no, May, April. sorry. Yeah, yeah, so say April. So you revenues, say it month. Revenue, average, well, your revenues or your collection divided by the number of visits. Yeah. Good. That's your average collections per patient, which is an awesome number. Average production would be your net production divided by the patient visits, right? Pretty yep. easy. Yep. Everyone can go do this. So right now, everyone go do that. Go in your practice management software and go look at the production you had last month and then look at the number of patient visits that you saw last month and do the math. Just go do that math. It's pretty simple. What's a healthy, if Weston, if you were a practice owner, what would you strive to be? If you were a dentist and owner, like what would you say is like- That's such a hard question to answer. Okay. All right. Well, time. Let's time. say that I'm a GP dentist mm -hmm. and I might dabble in ortho. So maybe Invisalign or a little bit of ortho, but not, not full orthodontics. And I also might be dabbling in implants. And then I'm going to give a number of those. I know, but, but of all the numbers that you can give. Hey, Craig, pipe down. He's talking. But all the numbers you can give, this is the one that's going to make people feel either inadequate or. No, it's not. Because it's it's the other ones are totally right. level the playing field. No one's going to some get people, Because listen, it. Wes has guys that do $1,500 PPV. I just asked a simple question. Patients Look, a day, and there's another guy that makes ten patients a day at 500 PPV. Look, Craig's yeah. got Craig's got a good point. I mean, he's no. got a good point. There are practices that focus, but he's I'm such a candy I'm, ass sometimes. I know he is kind of. <laughs> I'm taking out these anomalies, so I'm taking out the bottom ten and the top ten percent before I give you this number. Okay, if I was a GP <laughs> practicing today, I would at least want my average production per visit sitting north of five hundred dollars north of $500. Now I want you to recognize something. When, I, when I'm looking at that number, this counts your hygiene visits. Yep. I'm looking at overall visits, the total number of patient visits seen in the practice. Now this is why I say that number, and I don't care what practice you are. You let me look at your data, and I will show you all the patients that are unscheduled, that need to be scheduled, that would bring your production per visit up to that mark. So often what happens when we're scheduling patients in our practice, we go to unscheduled lists or we go to the ASAP list and we never analyze who's the best patient. We never look at that. We're just going through who needs scheduled and who's unscheduled. And I'm telling you right now, every practice out there has wow. more patients sitting there unscheduled that would bring their average production per visit above the $500. And I will prove that with data on your practice. No matter if it's PPO, uh, I don't care. That's matter. why I'm okay. saying okay. I, I can filter out your contracted fee schedules right now too and deal with the ones that are the higher rates. Wow. And that's what your schedulers don't do, right? They don't ever really look at who they're scheduling. They just look at who's unscheduled and they've got to fill the holes. That's well, that's also level. the dentist that says, I just want to do marketing. So yeah. they don't want to, people don't want to change their batting average. They just want more up at bats. Right. That is what so, they want. They want to take more swings. Yeah. So it's like if you have a way to just be more efficient and change your batting average, it's better than having more up at bats. You'll get exhausted if you have more. So, up -bats. so Peter, that answers your question. Be over 500. Now, Craig, to your point, though, 
everyone's different. And you're right. We have practices north of 1600. And also if you do a lot of ortho, like, so my, you're going to jump up. Well, no, my PPV is actually lower because of ortho because I have a lot of visits oh, that, are no, yeah, yeah. that have because no production. For a lot of adjustments with no, with well, no, no. like aligner deliveries are zero dollar visits. I have right. days where the, you know, I could do, you know, three. So, to answer the question now for, to justify for you, Craig, because you're feeling like you're inadequate now. No, I just don't want the viewers to, the listeners to. Oh, I get it. Here's the deal. The point is knowing where you're at. Where are you? First, where are you? Right. And then how do you improve it? Right. That's the point. So if my production per visit today is sitting at $238, well, I, six months from now, I don't want it sitting at $200. All that means is I'm doing a lot more patient visits with less production going on, which means I'm busier and I'm less efficient. Right, less but there's other ways, like if you add a hygienist, and again, I'm not, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but there's other things. You add at a hygienist, okay? Because you're growing. If you add a hygienist, Craig, your restorative production should be jumping up by 60%. 100%. Wes, I use this actually too when I'm evaluating acquisitions because if I see a low APP or a PPV number, I know there's a lot of dentistry to be done in that a acquisition. Huge opportunity. Right. And so, so it works. It, I mean, it's just such a valuable tool in, in all senses of the word. Um, like I would never do that. That person who has the gold star and, and has $1,700 average is $1,700 because there's probably no dentistry to be done in that practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, well, he's focused, that guy's focused on cosmetic only, right? Um, that's right. Practice. So yeah. they're a cosmetic practice, but that, I mean, you're both making really good arguments here and points. I mean, the first, the first part is to make sure you know where you're at. And Craig, if someone all of a sudden introduced ortho and now they have a ton of visits coming in in a month and their revenue's not there because they're doing a bunch of visits on the ortho stuff that's not generating the revenue, it's okay. You're going to see a drop, but at least you know why. And you can calculate right. that. And then you establish this ortho side of the practice at this moment. And then you get that baseline number. And again, the goal is once you're there, how do I improve? Yeah, you could almost strip those out too. You know, if yeah, you really you wanted, to get, those out. If you wanted to get granular with it. All yeah. right, let's go, to, let's go to number. Okay, dose. hygiene reappointment percentage. So Craig, you talked about this pre-appointment percentage. And um, this goes to the concept that you were referencing right at the very beginning of you talked about a group practice and you had 100 locations. And he had no idea what his net patient growth was. Um, I was just on a practice that was spending $7,200 a month in new patient marketing. He was averaging between 50 and 70 new patients every single month. So as high That's as inefficient. 70, Jeez. his low was 50 and he's spending $7,200 a month on these new patients. Is, he, is it a new patient, a new practice? It is a newer practice. So I mean, his cost of acquisition was what? what? What is the math on that again? So he's spending 7,200, the highest the highest that he had in a month was 70. Okay, so, so he's sending a over a hundred dollars a new, new for a cost of acquisition. Yeah, he's somewhere between a hundred and 125 dollars each month. Wow. Okay. It's not crazy. And if you keep your customers, it's great. Yeah, I was gonna say that's not horrible. Here's the problem. His net growth was flat. <laughs> okay, so he was just breaking even, right? And this is a chart we have in our data so you can see this, but he was literally breaking even. He was losing 70 patients every single month and growing 70 patients every month and spending $72. So wait, wait. We, so unpack that a little bit, Weston, for everybody, because this may be people's first time. So it's why we don't track new patients. You know, it's a new patient, you track net growth. So unpack the three things that compose that formula. Okay, you so here's, here's how you lose patients. New patients, we know what those are. Those are new okay. patients that came into the practice and actually completed an appointment for the first time ever. That's how we calculate it in, in, our, in our analytics. A lost patient is someone that you either in your practice management software went and marked as inactive. So they said, hey, I'm moving, I'm done. So someone actually took the liberty to go mark them inactive. Um, or it's someone that has not been in your practice now for 18 months. So meaning you haven't seen them for almost, well, a year and a half. You haven't seen them. Um, I would like to lower that number. If you haven't seen someone in a year, I feel months. like it's 12, it needs to be 12 months. I agree with you. You need to look at it. That would just really disrupt people right now for all the day that we have going on in here. But that's how we're tracking that. So when I look at our net growth, I'm taking my new, the first time visit. So if I had a hundred in a month, and then I'm subtracting now either my people I marked as inactive 
and you can't control those that you really, if someone passes away or someone moves away or someone lost their job, I mean, it's hard. You're going to have some natural attrition, but here's the deal. The attrition should be less than 8%. 8% of what? That, that net attrition. So if I started out with 1,000 patients in January, when I look at all my lost patients, it should be less than 8%. On the annual? On the start of the number of patients that I had at the beginning of the year. Okay, those so it's a yearly. Patients, how many of those patients did I lose in that 12-month period? Where is this in our dashboard, by the way, in Dental Intel dashboard? The, the, your attrition percentage? Yeah. So like these things like over the year, like yeah, I'm almost thinking like they'd be really good to have. Um, and again, I'm sorry if you already have these, but some like, do you have like a chat, like a dental Intel, like thinkers group or Facebook group where we can all share these best practices and someone from your team can moderate? We do. I, mean, I would love for you to go get in it. It's a dental Intel community and there is a lot of chatting that goes on there. We probably need to do better. In fact, why don't you be my moderator? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know if I'm equipped to be that guy, but yeah, you're it's on. Pretty good. You're pretty good. But it's you're on, right. We could be Facebook? better on that. We it's could be the better. Dental Intel community, right? It is Facebook. It's only for Dental Intel customers, but maybe we should do one that's. No, why well, don't leave it for customers? I'm cool with that. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying like we're, Pete and I are big proponents and we're looking, it's the Dental Intelligence community, correct? Yeah, that is correct. So, yeah, dental intelligence. I'm trying to find it. It's Craig, I'm gonna get on there as someone, someone like a false identity, and just literally just ask you the hardest shit ever as a moderator. Be like, uh, yeah. uh, I don't see well, it. I would What's love to be able to have a moderator here and call upon you guys because you perform so well in certain areas that it'd be nice to have your expertise shared there with those with that okay. group. So, well, where is it, man? I'm trying to find it. I'm gonna send you the link, Craig. All right, all right, and all right. I can't multitask like you. So no, I can't I'm either. I'm just, I just stopped listening to her on the podcast and trying to do this. So here's the deal. This practice is pre-appointment percentage that was break even was sitting at 24%, meaning out of all of the active patients that he had in his practice, only 24% of them were scheduled to come back in either A, with a hygienist or B, with a doctor. I don't care why they were coming in. That's what they were coming in. His pre-appoint was 24%? 24%. So you yeah, have to look at what huge hole. We have to figure out why is only 24%, and I'm telling you right now, I'm going to show it again. It was because of his hygiene reappointment percentage. Uh, yeah, and I'll tell you the most common thing. Do you want to make your next appointment to see us? No, that's really. Cool. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, right? do, do you want, like, let, let, let's see how this works. Checking at the Ritz-Carlton. Did you want to leave a credit card, or do you want to just maybe pay when you leave? Do you want to pay today, or do you want to pay next time? Yeah. I mean, you know, never ask a yes or no question to something that you require a yes to. Right. You know, like we have safety glasses that we put on every patient, you know, and I, I, I can't tell the team how many times, do you want to wear the safety glasses? Do you want to wear, you want to wear these sunglasses? And they say, no, I'm good. And then they have to go, and, well, Mrs. Jones, you have to wear them. Like what, why'd you ask? Let's yeah. go ahead and put it doesn't your safety glasses. Well good at that point. No, it's it doesn't. Friction. Yeah. Why, why create friction when you don't have to? Let's go ahead and wear your protective eyewear. Here's so the listen, deal. I'm going to I'm you gonna need jump. To know how your hygienists are doing. So look at it. And then you need to know what to say, which is what Craig's getting into. He's telling you what not to say. But right now, this practice was sitting at 45%, meaning out of 10 patients, four and a half of them rescheduled their hygiene. You do that after all your patients coming in for a month, and you can see really quickly if only if you had 10 and only five scheduled, those five came back in six months. And now what's scheduling? only two and a half of those. And eventually you don't have any patients in hygiene and you have to get new patients to keep up with that. So I'm telling you right now, if I could measure one metric right now and, I'm a, and I have hygiene in my practice, one of those metrics would be hygiene reappointment. We need to make sure that we're well there. Okay, so the question, I'm about to ask something related to the last one that when Craig got so upset. If you were the, what would you say is a great no, I love this because now it's percentages. Oh, because now it applies percentages to Percentages are great because a percentage, no matter what you're doing, is a benchmark that we can all strive for. Yeah. So right now, the average in dental Intel users, which is just over 4,000 practices, is sitting at 72%. Where does it need to be? 85 north. North of 85%. Yeah, that's so really eight important. And half, eight and a half patients out of 10 need to be making sure you're rescheduling. Some people will be saying, well, I want 100. No, you don't. Yeah, Here's yeah, the yeah. issue. There are some patients you don't ever want back, first and yeah. foremost. 
I mean, let's be real about that. Don't bring them back. If you don't want them back, fire them and deactivate them. Just don't reschedule those guys. That's a great, that's a great lever, by the way, that you can, that you can quickly change in your practice. Like some things, some things are hard and heavy lifting in your practice to change. It just is like, right. Like changing new patients requires getting more or whatever. Like that's an easy lever identify that Amber and you know, one of your hygienists is not performing well, spend a little time with some verbiage, do the things you kind of talked about, Craig, like that's such an easy lever to fix. So easy. So how do you measure this in your practice management software? Um, because I, I want people to go look at it. So I'm going to tell you how to measure it out of your practice management software. Mm -hmm. You can't, I don't, I don't, I don't care what practice management software you have. You cannot go calculate this. So I'm not going to tell you us into that one. You got me. I'm not going to tell you how to do out of your software, but I am going to tell you how to go do it. You need to have an Excel sheet or a spreadsheet or something of all your hygiene patients coming in in the day and literally just mark them all in. And then someone needs to go and look at their next appointment and guys, you don't count it as reappointed if they're scheduled with the doctor. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that they're scheduled with the hygienist because the reality is they may come in and see you, Dr. Spodak, but the last thing you're going to say is the doctor sitting in the chair fixing their tooth is, hey, do we have you scheduled to come back in for your hygiene appointment? You're just not thinking that. And so we, we need to make sure that they're scheduled for hygiene. So here's how you do it. You have a spreadsheet, name of all the hygiene patients coming in, and then before you leave at the end of the day, you go in and you write down the date that they're reappointed for so that you can now check, yes, this patient's coming back in for hygiene. That's the only way you can do it. It's a manual process or you get some kind of analytic software out there that can do this for you. But here's the deal, and I wanna drive this home because this is a critical metric. If you have 1,200 active patients, can I post something like on this so people can download something? Because I wanna post an Excel spreadsheet. Because I, I want people to see this math. It's pretty simple, but I want you to see it. You can, we can post a link in the uh, show notes or. Okay. Um, we'll get this posted. It's an Excel spreadsheet I'm going to show you. So let's just say you're an average practice. Here's the average practice. 1,200 active patients. Averaging 20 new, new patients every single month. So a practice has 1,200 patients, averaging 20 new patients, and I'm going to put in there 75% hygiene reappointment percentage. So that's practice A. Practice B, exact same thing. 1,200 active patients and 20 new patients a month, but I'm going to bump up that hygiene reappointment percentage to 85%. Go look at month 60. That's five years, you guys. Wait, and the difference was only 10%, the delta? 10% on hygiene reappointment. Go look at month 60, and you're going to see practice B has double, twice as many active patients as practice A. So um, I'll, I'm going to let you see it. So you, But guys, the concept of reversing this, because this is hard for people to digest, just take the principle of saying, okay, if I had 100 patients come in for hygiene and I was repointing at 75%, that means 75% are coming back, 75 of them. Now they come back, I have 75 reappointing at 75%. That means 56 are coming back. I want to see and this. It keeps going down. If you bump that up just by 10%, the math in five years is twice as many active patients. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. Albert Einstein says the eighth wonder of the world is the law of compound interest. It's the yeah. same thing. Same. No one, everybody doesn't like one, one and two and three and 4% means nothing to us. Dentists are not even looking at it. Who cares? It's a rounding error. But the law shows over long term, you're going to either make a huge practice or- Hey, for yeah. all of your listeners, if they want us to show what their hygiene reappointment was for this last year, we will do it for the first 50 people that want to reach out. A free sync install, we'll let them see that number. But I'm telling you right now, if you can figure out where you're at and then measure this ongoing, you guys, you can really accelerate your growth. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I'm already full. Well, of my well how do they do that? You just gave an offer, so we need to give a directive. So how, um, what do they email? Can they email you somewhere? Um, they, you, you, Yes. Have, have them email me directly. Oh, wow. Really? It's a big dog. Oh, Wes, that's a, I know you really well. Don't, let's not do that. Let's do that. I don't know who to have email right now. I know you really, really well. Here's the deal. Wes is a big idea, idea guy, but you don't have the bandwidth for that. I don't want to. Okay. That. Have them email me. and well, I Have them email Bulletproof and we'll forward it on to you. No, don't do that. We don't have the bandwidth either. Here's How about the deal. Don't you have a general box that you can handle this as well? If we send you 10 yeah. clients, can we get a free soda pop? 
Look, I'm Who's not first? trying to get the client. I just want them to see their hygiene reappointment. I want their world to be open here. So um, have them email me, Craig. Weston at dentalintel.com. I'm not, I'm likely, well, I will reply to you and I will CC someone that has very clear instructions. You are not to sell this individual my software. If you want it, great, but they're not to sell you. I just want you to get the information. That's awesome. cool. I like it. So, um, Weston at dentalintel.com. Okay, real quick. Those practices that are thinking, well, I have, my chairs are full of patients. I don't even have room for new patients. Great. You still need to have your hygiene reappointment percentage high. Here's why. Because at some point, you can start doing what I call patient selecting. And so then when I'm looking at all my patients, and you can use Dental Intel to do this, but we're filtering by who are those that have the highest show rates? Who are those patients that have the highest collections in the year? Like who are my most valuable patients? Who are those patients that have the highest treatment acceptance percentage? And you start filtering out and saying, these are the patients I care about. And now you're starting to slowly fire the other patients that are not very valuable for the practice. Because if you only have so much room, keep the patients that are saying yes to their sort of care that needs to be done to get healthy. There's no sense in keeping the patients that are saying no to you. What's the point in bringing them in every six months? So it's still important to grow your practice in hygiene because you're able to identify the right patients, not just, not just any patient, but the right ones. And we can help, help with that as well. Hey, Wes, selfish, uh, selfishly motivated here, but that, that, that patient locator thing that you're talking about? Call patient finder. Patient finder. I don't know if yep. we're, uh, Peter, are you using it yet? I don't think I'm using it. Well, uh, let's do a training off this podcast and I'll show you guys how to do it. But it's pretty phenomenal. If yeah, you I like want, it. I will ensure that the only dentistry you're doing next month are crowns in your practice. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Wes, can we do that? Can you hook up yeah. with Erica and do that? Yep, I will do that with her. And then Peter, you let me know who you want me to show in your office, whoever your treatment coordinator is there. Okay. Um, the last metric, treatment acceptance percentage. I'm. I, this is probably one that I'm most passionate about, but... If you want to improve production in your practice, get your patients to say yes to the restorative care that you're saying they need in order to get healthy or stay healthy. I mean, and, and here's, here's the deal, you guys. All of us are thinking they're saying yes. I mean, we do. There's not a doctor that walks out of his operatory with a patient that walks away not thinking that he has some form of compliance with the patient. The patient's sitting there, the doctor sees the need, he has a conversation with the patient, the patient acknowledges that, yeah, this is something that probably needs to get taken care of, because generally the doctor doesn't walk out until that acknowledgement is there. And the reality is you're left, you, you leave the operatory now, and now there's more dialogue going on with the team member that's left in that chair. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's that team member taking it to the treatment coordinator, and now you have two hands that there's dialogue going on with. But measuring and monitoring the treatment acceptance percentage by your chairs, by chairs, you guys, which means it's by assistance and by hygienist is hugely impactful. I mean, it makes night and day differences. And here's the thing that I know about hygienists over the years of working in the industry. They're so competitive. It's funny how competitive they are. Mm -hmm. They're so competitive. And here's the great thing. I'm not telling a hygienist to do more production because that's the last thing she wants to see. If you want to measure one thing that's going to make your hygienist smile, go get a number that shows how much pocket debt she's reduced over her career in dentistry, because that will get her to smile. But we can't do that right now. So let's measure the amount of treatments that's being said yes out of her chair, because that is very patient driven and health focused. It's a need and they said yes. And if you can measure that one number by hygienist, because you're diagnosing a lot in those hygiene chairs. You can measure that one number by hygienist and start go back to your Pearson's Law, Peter, that you were talking about before. And then Craig added to that. Pearson didn't say report it back. He said what gets measured and proves. There's been individuals that have added to that. If you report it back, it accelerates. Um, but if you I, apply those- We've had this conversation before, by the way, Wes, sorry. I know, I, you give a bad attribution. I, I, and, no, and, I know, but I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just showing it from Google. Google's like uh, God. Yeah, they stole it. Okay, but it says like on, yeah, it says when here that- performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported back, the rate of improvement accelerates. Yeah, so it says that which is measured, improved, that which is measured, reported back, improved exponentially. Carl Pearson. Yeah. 
Talk, go back and do oh, the then research. Thomas S. Monson said when performance is measured and reported back, the rate of improvement accelerates. It's good to be Thomas Monson. Yeah. Someone else's law. Yeah, that better. second piece. He does yeah. that to me all the time, by the way. Pete's That's like right. the Monson. I'm the Pearson. So here's the deal. <laughs> I would recommend looking at the treatment acceptance percentage by your hygienist and then take it another level once you master that. Once you master that element of it, now look at your treatment acceptance percentage by your assistants, because it's the same concept, you guys. When you have a new patient coming in and you're doing a limited or a full exam, and you're doing, and, and you're doing a consult with that individual, and you diagnose treatment, who's in the operatory after you walk out? It's your assistant and or your hygienist. That's who's left there. And there's dialogue going on there. And if you can start letting these guys see their performance on those patients say yes, and they're looking that on a weekly basis and you're rewarding those and high-fiving those that are at the high and you have this conversation of Jennifer talk to me about what you're saying with the patients when I leave the operatory because you're 10% higher than everyone else can you just help us understand what that dialogue sounds like and let their genius come out you don't even have to be the consultant let them tell the office what's happening if you do that one thing you're going to see a 10% bump in your treatment acceptance percentage and likely even higher than that. Um, and it's impactful, but here's the deal. You can't just jump on the scale once and lose 10 pounds and then think you're gonna maintain it because you're gonna start going back eating those donuts in the morning. You've gotta look at this every single week and get in the habit of doing this. So those are three critical metrics. Maybe those are metrics that people would expect to measure, but those are the ones that I would think are not likely that people are thinking about. So just to recover those or, or re recap, production per visit, easy number to measure, hygiene reappointment percentage, not as easy to measure, but you can do it. You need to manually do it. Or if you take me up on my offer, I'll get it to you for free so you can see where you're at. And then your treatment acceptance percentage. Again, not too easy to measure, but you could put up some spreadsheets to do that. Or you could get a software that, that analyzes that type of stuff for you. Is that helpful? That's very helpful, super helpful. I think the most important thing is, um, you know, obviously knowing what to do and then doing it. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is potential power. Execution is power. And uh, it's important to point out that even though you make it easy without the diligence of paying attention to it and acting on it, uh, and that's hard. People, I, I could see why people will hate on uh, your company. I could actually see why, because if you're paying this money, you're getting, them, you're getting the information and you're not doing it, it's really hard to take a long look in the mirror and say, I screwed up. It's just easier to, you know, say, ah, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, it's, you know, a bunch of crap. And We're it's all really hoping for that magic bullet, right? We're all oh, yeah, we'd love it. That's why people, Peter constantly, Peter and I constantly get calls. We just want to pick your brain on marketing because they figure all we have, like if, if people in my area is like, oh, yeah, Spodak, he's a great marketer. Like that's bullshit. You know, I mean, marketing, you can't, you can't have enough marketing to, to offset a poor business. You can't, I mean, maybe 15, 20 years ago, you could just be a great marketer and wind up, you know, uh, getting successful, but there's a meritocracy. It's called Google. It's called reviews. If you're crappy at what you do and you just have a really healthy marketing budget and acquiring new patients, you will actually run out of business eventually. Right. Weston, the one thing I remember being on the phone debating about whether I was going to uh, use dental intel or not, I guess two and a half years ago. And the one thing when I heard the gamification of hygienist A, Dr. B, and hygienist A, Dr. C, and looking at that data and gamifying it in terms of it immediately like a light bulb went off for me. And I was like, wow, I need to put, I need to put Amanda and Dr. B together way more. And I need to put, you know, and that was, that was like, just again, it's just an arbitrage, right? It's an arbitrage yeah. of the opportunity that you have, Like, right? Why? Like, let's get the person who hits best together up at bat together the most. And so to kind of, some of the listeners may not know what you're talking about, but one of the things that we, we were passionate about measuring here at Dental Intel is your treatment acceptance percentage by your teams. So looking at the acceptance rate between you and hygienist A, you and hygienist B, you and assistant A, you and assistant B, that's really important for us to see that because mm -hmm. one hygienist might be performing really well with you and not really well with your other associate doctor if you have multiple doctors. And it was not what I would have get, meaning the data was not aligned with But my, data's my never, gut. emotions are true. always, uh, but I, I shouldn't say never, but data, 
is should always be emotionless. Like you could see, think you're doing really well. Data shows you're doing otherwise. You could feel usually, you know, I think most people rely upon their gut to run their businesses and it's really, it's really doing a disservice. Here's one, one other principle with this too, Gary or, or Craig, you don't want people to, I mean, emotions are going to surface. They are going to surface. And when you look at some of this data, these three metrics, when you go look at that, you're going to have a certain amount of emotion surface immediately when you mm -hmm. see it. Some of you might be excited about where you're at. Some of you might be really discouraged, but here's the deal. And I, I try to help people understand this. It doesn't matter where you're at. What matters is what you're going to do with it. And if you're not performing well, if you go to your team and you tell them they're not performing well, well, man, you just killed the, golden, the, the, the goose that lays the eggs, right? You just did. You shot them. And uh, the reality is what we should be doing is going to them and saying, guys, I've got some really exciting news for us. We're sitting at 62% hygiene reappointment percentage, which means we have so much more opportunity than we thought we could. Can we talk about what we might be able to do differently to bump this up to 85%? And then just as the practice owner, or if this is the office manager doing it, just be quiet. Let them start answering. Instead of saying, we need to be at 85%, we're at 62%, why are we not there? Don't do that. What are you not doing? Say, can we just, we have a huge opportunity here. What can we do? What is it? So, so just start throwing out some ideas, just talk about what we can do. And when someone brings up an idea, even if it's not the best idea, support it, validate it, run with it because they're thinking now. And, and reward it though too. So, Hey, I'll add, piggyback on that. Hey, and if we do hit it, like I'd like to take y'all out to dinner or yes. something that, that, that kind of commemorates the, the action, right? That you focus get. on the negative, focus on action, and focus on rewarding action. Yeah. 100%. I always catch, I always catch someone doing something positive. I mean, as, as owner leaders, managers, and we always well, find out what you're doing negative too. You just make sure your ratio is, is, is that of uh, not the three to one leader, not the three to one. Thank you. Thank you. Three celebrations of everyone helpful observations. So important. Uh, yeah. Well, I love it. I mean, that was, okay, Wes, do you know what this is by the way? I just want to just ask you. I think I think, guava. I think, yeah. Is it a guava? No, don't, don't help him out, Pete. Give him oh. one more chance. What is it? It's not a guava. It, don't say it. it Does it have any red on it? Turn it. Turn it. Oh, I think that's what it is. For those of you who are not listening, you'd have to guava. No, no, this is actually a mango. Is it a mango? Yeah. So okay. Life in the tropics. This came from my, my father's tree and he wrote from dad, love you. So that's what my dad does. He I does. love mango, but mangoes usually have a lot more orange yellow in them. There's, there's 500 species of mango. I have what's equivalent of Why dental intel for that, mangoes. It's mango Why? intel. Okay. How do you know there's 500 species, but you don't know what your last month's production? I'm just kidding. No, you a hole. <laughs> no, uh, no, Pete. I know so much about trees, man. It's crazy. I am like, I'm a major horticulturalist. It's a little unknown fact. That and freestyle rapping. I've got don't two. Don't ever tell me that one of my best buddies is a horticulturist. Something I can't even pronounce. <laughs> ever. Really? Well, you can't pronounce half those words we use. But no, yeah. no, no. I can't pronounce imanimony. <laughs> so wait, I want to unfurl this note because uh, this is cool. Wes, you know my dad. Actually, Pete, you know my dad too. So this is what he gave for you. For you guys, love dad. Isn't oh, that cool? Was... With a mango. My dad gave me a mango today. How cool oh, is he that? He really folded that paper. There is a lot of crease. No, I was just, just nervous. Know. Just I, I crease it like that, you know? Okay. okay. Yeah. It wasn't for any specific reason. Just for you guys, oh, love, okay. love dad. So they probably they fall in his yard, right? No, he's cultivating mangoes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was thinking he picked he picked up something that fell in his yard on the way to work. I was like, oh, Here you go, buddy. Pete, one more thing. Remind me to fill you in about this stuff. This toothpaste, Rise Well. Uh, that looks multi level marketing. I'm good. No, it's not multi level marketing. I'm sorry. Does it have milk in it? Dairy? No, it has um uh hy uh, uh hydroxyapatite actually. It's hey, pretty cool. Did you guys hear about the young lady that passed away from a toothpaste recommended from the doctor? No, what was the toothpaste? So she was allergic to dairy. Oh, wow. Oh, so it's like an MI paste. Paste with dairy in it. But the I think MI paste has it. 13 years old. Oh, and no. Recommended and uh, had is no he, Is he, because he recommended it, is he? It's uh, not, no, it's not his fault. I mean, reality is he, he's not asking what people are allergic to, but I thought it'd be a good thing just now as Dennis. If there's dairy products dairy. sitting in toothpaste, you may want to consider looking at that before. Yeah, so uh, MI paste um, comes from the dairy cows of New Zealand. Milk does not originate from Java, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, MI, MI paste has uh, dairy in it. Wow. Yeah. Well, it was one brushing. 
That is crazy. I've never, yeah, I had not heard is. that. It's April 15th, 2019, uh, Allergic Living Magazine. A California family has, has been left devastated after their, after their dairy allergic child died of severe allergic reaction. Oh, poor thing. How old was, did you say 15? I was thinking. No, 11, 11, 11 years 11. old. She's so beautiful too, man. I mean, if oh. you go through and read the story, the mom oh. and father were like, just, they looked at everything, but didn't think about looking at this toothpaste. Oh I mean, my one good thing God, man. About, so. yeah, yeah, MI Paste does have, it's exactly what it was. It's a great, great product by GC. Um, but yes, it does have dairy in it. Yeah, it's a really, actually a really good product, but uh, obviously. I didn't know how that got up. You she brought up went into anaphylactic. She's that allergic to dairy? She anaphylactic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they took her to the dentist. The girl had some spots in her teeth. The dentist office suggested MI Pace, one of the brand of Medicaid tooth pass. Could, uh, after years of reading toothpaste labels, um, never seeing milk present, neither the mother nor daughter had the least suspicion that milk exposure could be a risk. Because of that, I did not think to look at the product ingredients. Um, contrary to what everyone keeps telling me, I feel like I failed her. Is what her mother said through tears. What she did. Um, yeah. So uh, it turns out there's a small warning label. The brand's toothpaste contains an ingredient recalcident and milk protein on the front of the small tube. Um, yeah, I, I'm presuming reaction turned bad quickly. Denise had some allergic reaction over the years, but nothing compared to this one. Through the evening of April 4, she began brushing her teeth with the new toothpaste with her 15-year-old sister in the bathroom. The sister said Denise had almost immediately began crying and ran to her mother's room. I think I'm having an allergic reaction. Her lips were already blue. Oh, my God. So she, oh, terrible. So they grabbed the EpiPen, administered it right then on the um, spot. But she was saying, Mommy, I can't breathe. I was saying, I love you. Yes, you can. In desperation, Monique, Monique was going to run outside. 9-11 operator asked the daughter, does your mother know CPR? Oh, man, this is terrible. Oh, God. Yeah, terrible, terrible. So listen, take home reminder here. Ask your patients if they have an allergy because MI Paste is a good product. We use it quite frequently, but um, it does contain milk. And uh, allergies are definitely on the rise from what I can apparently. Uh, you need to put that on the box. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Know. It is, though. It is. That it there is a warning. It's just, it's. Who thinks you wouldn't think that? so. You wouldn't. Who would think ever so. think there's dairy in toothpaste? You would never. I, as a parent, I would never even. Uh, terrible. Yeah. So on the label itself, um, it, it has that on it. It has it contains milk. Well, all right. Well, because you're awesome. Sorry to end on such a low. I was note. gonna say we just yeah. Ended up, well, well, well. yeah. All from the mango. All from a mango. <laughs> and by the way, uh, mangoes are very aller aller allergenic as well. Like the sap is an irritant. So uh comes full circle back to the mango. Anyway, Wes, it was a real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for always Thank you. Uh, making us. Uh, that was awesome. Here. I am going to give you a link so people can play with that Excel spreadsheet to see what their reappointment yeah, Email it to us and we'll insert it in the, uh, in the show notes. Sounds and also, good. Wes, do you want to, we just had a really cool offer from you guys. Do you want to speak about that in the podcast right um, now, but for our um, summit for the. Yeah, for the guys, if, if you want to take a look at these numbers, if you email me directly, it's Weston at dentalintel.com. I will make sure you get a free review of these metrics so you can see where you're performing. And then I uh, even chat with you guys a little bit. I probably won't be the one chatting with you all. Um, unless you come here to Utah, you can come see me face to face. Then I'll chat with you. But Weston at I've, I've been. Yeah, it's awesome. I yeah, think it's awesome. you're coming out here soon. Maybe just yep. Pete. June yeah. 2nd. June 2nd. What are you going out there for, Pete? Just to hang out and look at my data. He hasn't, he hasn't seen our offices, so he's going to come hang out with us. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Let's go in uh, December and snowboard. Yes, okay. let's do it. Or let's go to the lake and on a houseboat. You guys can chill with us in the fall if you want. Let I'm me know. For that. Cool. Good stuff, Wes. Always a pleasure seeing you, man. And thanks for all the support. Um, and uh, thanks for uh, helping support our, our summit upcoming in June 14th. And You're welcome. And I'm excited finished. about that. We're going to, and for my customers that are, that are looking at, for Dental Intel customers, we're willing to cover $550 of this awesome educational event. In fact, I, um, you guys do this every year. What, what number is this, Craig and Peter? Is this number, number two? This is number two. And I don't know if it's going to be every year, but we're, we're done. Uh, we're definitely uh, committed to this one. Well, I hope you do it every year. I mean, the feedback that I got back on your last one in the breakout sessions that you guys had was hugely impactful on a lot of practices. Probably yeah, one of cool. the best business courses on dentistry from two of the best business owners of dental offices Thank you. in the industry. So seriously, it's a good event. But our customers, Dental Intel, 
you reach out to us, we're, spon we're scholarshiping $550 um, of that event. And that's but, awesome. Yeah. So anyways. Thank you. Thanks, uh, that's Wes. a massive offer. Thank you so much. That's so cool. That speaks volumes for, uh, yeah, what, the way y'all think of us. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Craig. Wes. That was awesome, man. Always a Wes, pleasure. That was awesome. Yep. Have a good one. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. See ya.